Right then, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Bodybuilding Prospect with me and Al. And this week we have got a special guest, a very special guest on, uh, the one and only Mr. Joe Jeffrey. He is by far an expert within his field. Um, definitely the best mind in peds and enhancement practice within the UK and among the elite at the top of their game from around the world. Um, and yeah, great pleasure to introduce him and bring him on. Thank you, Joe, for coming on. Thank you for having me, bro. That was a big intro to live up to. The best in the field. Man, <laughs> this better be good then, isn't it? Um, so yeah, for anybody that doesn't know me, um, I've been coaching for quite a while. I think my first kind of speciality route or niche in bodybuilding was pharmacology studies and education and practice. And then that eventually just led into me coaching a lot of guys pharmacologically, so to speak. And then that just led into coaching. Um, and I've been around for quite a long time, I think, doing this. Coached a lot of different competitors over the years, every class, and continue to do so. Um, coaching for me now is just kind of, I've got a group of clients that I work with that very rarely changes. And I put a lot of my attention and focus into the education side of things now. And I use the physique collective medium to do that pretty much. That's like my vehicle to, um, it's my vehicle of that education work. So we have an app for anybody that's interested. If you hear anything in this podcast that you like the sound of, and you want to learn a bit more about search physique collective in the play store or the app store, it's a subscription service. So it's six ninety nine a month, but we've got like thousands of hours on there plus thousands of pages of discussions Sign up for a month, check it all out and cancel if you want. Um, you know, there's a lot on there to get through though. You'd have to watch it for a month solid probably to get through all the videos on there. I'll be um, impressed if someone yeah. through that in a month. Yeah, you'd have to have a lot of free time. If we got another lockdown, maybe someone would do it. Yeah. I think That's me. with this podcast, it's going to be a lot of us two sitting very quiet and listening as well as people are oh, we may jump in with questions and things like that but when we dive into a field such as this with knowledge that say joe has and this isn't chewing any ass or anything there is a level in between knowing and almost getting to know you know we're on the journey to getting to know and there's a lot of things that i'd hate to jump jump into something you know like you, you think that you know something and then joe will go into it and it's like four or five steps maybe even 10 above you know and it just completely will go over our heads so a lot of this is for people that are listening to come away with something to put into practice straight away, not just to listen to a podcast that some people do and say, oh, I heard this guy say this on a podcast. The goal is, what, who can I contact after this? What's best in, what are the first steps in, you know, going into a safe use model and who's contact for things like bloods and looking at overall health overall, overall in bodybuilding? Indeed. So what do you guys want to talk about? What's the first subject? safer use of peds and enhancements i don't want to use the term safer use model because people have become quite um, attached to it and it's, it's almost like a branded thing now between certain coaches yeah. um, but just your take on things to avoid like uh, just completely obviously we've we spoke on uh, sort of veterinary drugs and things that haven't passed human human clinical trials stuff like that mm -hmm. so people are actually aware of what is actually safe to use yeah um, so if we're going to talk about safer use, the first thing is just kind of understanding that any time you use these drugs at above a physiological threshold, you introduce a degree of risk, but also understand that as there's a dose response relationship with risk and negative by risk, I mean like deleterious health concerns, um, but the risk exponentially increases with the dose. So for example, if we took, a testosterone, a testosterone replacement therapy dose, just like ballpark it at 200 milligram for this individual, because it varies greatly, as you know, there's great biological inter-individuality. And we say, okay, there's, there's some risk of escalating that to 300 milligrams, but it's, you know, fairly minor. Um, and then maybe if you escalate that to 500 milligram, there's a much, or sorry, if you escalate that to 400 milligram for the same 100 milligram, dose increase there's a much greater risk than the previous 100 milligrams so on and so forth in this compounds and this is the primary reason why sledgehammering any one metabolic pathway is the wrong way 
to create the total net anabolic slash anti-catabolic outcomes that you want. At the end of the day, if we're talking about gaining muscle, that is a function of biasing the protein turnover equation to more synthesis and or less degradation. So muscle protein synthesis versus degradation. And most of these drugs are going to eventually get there, like through some way, like mm. whether it's at the androgen receptor or the growth hormone receptor or whatever it is. Um, so we would much rather use what I would call a polypharmacy model. So lots of different compounds to create a slight nudge on the anabolic or anti-catabolic or lipolytic. So basically what I'm saying here to cut through the jargon is like a little bit more muscle gaining, a little bit less muscle loss, a little bit more fat loss, um, a little bit less fat gain. That's called anti-lipogenesis. That, that's what anabolic steroids do mostly. Um, well, not mostly. I mean, how they contribute to fat loss, you know. Mm. Um, so we would much rather, if we're going to use drugs for bodybuilding, have a selection of multiple metabolic pathways to modulate um, as compared to, for example, and I often, I often use this one in um, the early, I would say the early 2010s. How do you say that? The early 10s, whatever it is. Um, and bodybuilding forums online, there would be a lot of this, right, if you're not using over a gram of testosterone or if you're not using this or that, then you've got no business using growth hormone or you've got no business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Which is crazy stuff. Another example that just popped into my head. If, you, if you're not at a, a gram of testosterone, then you don't need exotic drugs like Primo or Masteron. It's like, man, what are you saying? Is It's quite the opposite. You know, there's a reason, you know, I can imagine all these like pharmacology um, chemists that synthesize these steroidal psalms to be like so perfectly tissue selective and so mm. devoid of androgenicity, looking at those statements and crying. You know, it's like, I invented this thing so you didn't have to do that. <laughs> Mm. well it's not for us but you know medical deployment you know i've created something so much better i've improved on this um but anyway that that's a kind of aside there so you would look to use like the aforementioned drugs growth hormone and insulin to actually offer you an opportunity to not have to get to the thousand milligrams of testosterone for example you know, we've just elucidated that there's an exponential increase of risk with this one pathway as you turn it up. You'd much rather just touch multiple as compared to just sledgehammer one. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we come to the polypharmacy model and it's important to mention that because I think if somebody got their drug programming through and there was like 10 things on there, they'd be like, fuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like when i first joined joe and the cycle come through i was bamboozled is the easiest word to use and looking i was like first of all called george have you seen the amount of shit this guy's put on this fucking list you know i was like i don't even know how these things are and immediately that's the it was at the fight or flight and i was like i'm i'm not really a fan of this as mr minimal as i've called myself before wanting to use simply testosterone only thinking it's going to be the be all and end all of my bodybuilding and overall it came down to not feeling safe to use certain compounds and things like that and certain substances like growth hormone instant you hear all the horror stories and you know we spoke about it many times on concepts it's you know for example with insulin when we first started there were like five units it was like do you know little girls go to school in their school bag with more than you're taking right now you know, and they take more than you do and i'm like so I'm not going to take it. And if I don't eat within the first 20 minutes and 20 minutes after that and 20 minutes after that, I'm not going to die. You know, <laughs> those sort of horror stories. Boring. Now, there's some there's some great like case studies of like attempted suicide with insulin where like people uh, can't do it. Like it's, it's more difficult than it sounds like. If you've got a functioning pancreas, like, yeah, you could go hypo and like pass out. So if you're driving, like, yeah, that, that can be dangerous. But if you like pass out, eventually you'll regulate that and you'll mm. pull glucose from amino acids, glucagon and stuff like this and like you'll come around. Or 
worst case scenario, right? Let's say you accidentally overdose on insulin, which like, I mean, no offense by this, but you have to be like pretty sure to, to do that. It comes in a pen. Um, I just wouldn't recommend vials of insulin, but you know, if you've got a pen, you can turn it to the very specific dose that you're going to use. Like, how are you going to confuse an amount? And what amount would you have to take of Lantus, for example? Like, what amount of Lantus would you have to take to not be able to correct that hypo? Because it's going to come from a mile away. Oh, I feel yeah. like my blood glucose is a bit low. You know, with Lantus. So the LD50 of Lantus, for anybody listening that doesn't know, the LD50 means lethal dose 50. And this is the amount of a drug that will kill um, about 50% of the individuals that take it. So the LD50 of Lantus is 1,000 units. Um, and they come in 300 unit pens. Um, so you'd have to take more than three whole pens, which I don't know how you'd accidentally do. Like this is where like you'd have to take one out and then turn it. And what you can only turn it to, I think like 70 units at a time on the dial as well. So you'd have to like be turning it three times and get the next pen out and be like, oh shit, I was only meant to take five units. Like it's, you'd have to be crazy. And even then it would take ages. And an ambulance would just show up and IV some glucose and you'd be like, oh shit, I'm alive. And this is what happens on those, on these attempted suicide. I'm not, I'm by no means saying like insulin is a 100% safe drug because it's not, you can get yourself in trouble with it. But you know, it's when used sensibly, in fact, even when not used sensibly, like it's quite difficult as we just said to like fuck it up. Um, the issues come with like insulin protocols that are using super physiological amounts of these rapid acting insulins or when you you start like, yeah that? like um <laughs> i nearly said the name there um yeah, like if you're, gonna, if you're gonna use like a nova rapid or a humor log like 20 units with each meal with a lantus background at like 70 units and stuff that's believe me that's not out of this world for bodybuilding um there's someone that all of us know that i was consulting with not long ago who was using 200 units of lantus with uh, 25 units of Humalog, who's an American, at every meal. Um, that's when you're talking about hyperinsulinemia and then like massively increasing cardiovascular disease risk. And here we go as an example of like the, the metabolic pathway, like you've now cranked it out of this world and you're gonna make yourself extremely insulin resistant with that exposure to insulin. Um, and, and it can be dangerous when you're messing around with the administration method as well. People that inject insulin intramuscularly, for example, it changes the pharmacokinetics of the drug um, and like almost decreases the active life in the sense of the, the onset is much faster. There's a much greater peak and there's no real like anabolic advantage to this. I think it's just something that like bodybuilders do because it sounds interesting. Um, so that you can get yourself into trouble with that, but the trouble will be hypoing and having to eat food. Um, or if you haven't got any food around, you probably pass out, um, wake up eventually, or someone will come and IV glucose. You ain't gonna die, like. Um, but, I mean, you can, but you'd have to really take the piss. The, the, um, the only real story I saw of it was alcohol mixed with insulin usage as a, as a method to commit suicide. Mm, mm. I, I can't imagine any bodybuilders out there that are drinking every day and using insulin. <laughs> No, I've literally just, I was just talking with a friend literally right before this podcast about bodybuilders and class A's um, because they're calorie free and push up expenditure. <laughs> um, you know, this is, is super common. You don't see much alcohol in bodybuilding. Mm. But you see a lot of like stimulant use, obviously. Stimulant um, is the easiest way to put it, is it? Yeah. <laughs> half, a, half a gram of charge. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are we talking about? Yeah, so like Alex, if I use your example, right, if we said, okay, um, I'm just going to pull a number out of my answer. So we got like 750 milligrams of testosterone per day, for example, like the, per day, sorry, per week. Don't do that. This is your like protocol. Um, and then I said, okay, well, let's do 300 milligrams of testosterone with this, 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 and this, which is what happened, right? You know, um, and this is much safer um it's hard to think but i'm using more drugs but when you look into the stress load given by each particular drug because 
we're working under different metabolic pathways. You know, when we talk about anabolics, we're working under, right, this can get complicated, so I'll try and keep it simple. We're working under primarily the androgen receptor, the estrogen receptor, and the glucocorticoid receptor. There's lots of like genomic and non-genomic signaling and gene transcriptions and stuff in, involved in this. And, but for the most part, we've got binding at the androgen receptor, which is just transcribing anabolism, turning on protein accretion, which is gaining muscle. You've got other uh, androgen receptor actions like in adipocytes, which are fat cells that drive anti-lipogenesis, which is like attenuating the ability to gain fat. Um, the estrogen receptors actions on the growth hormone IGF axes and the glucocorticoid receptors actions on inhibiting cortisol and turning down muscle protein breakdown. You've got this stuff happening, but that's very separate to what else is happening. You know, growth hormone receptor, insulin receptor, what L-carnitine is doing to things like beta oxidation, what insulin is doing for nutrient partitioning and beta cell function and blah, blah, blah. They're all, you have to look at them as like separate pathways. So they're, they're like different stressors basically and spreading that out. So you're just kind of tweaking each one. Or if you're going to be a pro bodybuilder and really press it, maybe like, moderately or or even pretty hard turning up each one rather than absolutely caning the life out of five grams of anabolics maybe you might only need three with six units of growth hormone and 40 units of insulin or something these are extreme dosages that my clients wouldn't do but um that happens in the bodybuilding world so that's the polypharmacy model hypotheses in a in a nutshell that all makes sense yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I, these are things that I, when I have consultations and they're, they're kid, people that have done like one or two cycles and they come to me wanting to take it further and you say to them, well, okay, right, well, if you want to go, you know, the goal is to get here, right, well, this is what you would need to do to get here, just based purely off of what you said is the goal. They look at it and go, oh, shit, uh, all of that, really? I and mean, mm. it's hard to try, same as what you have with Alex, trying to actually break it down and say like, without that background knowledge or them understanding, no, this is what we're doing. We're literally signaling different pathways in the body to achieve a better outcome and reduce stress and um, excessive stress put on the body. Mm. Trying to get that message across to them is, is often quite hard without, you know, trying to let things go over their head. Yeah. And I think this is a, a good point. We could make like a, a juncture here to coaching education coaches now man there's a lot <laughs> you know you know this wasn't like it wasn't anything like this when i started coaching there wasn't that many coaches i remember only knowing like dante trudell and skip hill and then shelby starts like i didn't know anyone else had coached and then i remember there was austin and i started doing a podcast with Austin. like Honestly, there wasn't really anyone else. Co- and this is when the bodybuilding.com forum started to become a thing and Lane yeah. Norton started coaching. So it, wa- it wasn't what it is today. Now, I almost get anxiety like looking at the breadth of coaches that exist today. Um, but anyway, sorry. There's a, an onus on these individuals if you're going to be talking about performance enhancing drugs to have a, a high degree of education on their use. Because out of all of the vectors that we control, training, nutrition, I can confidently say that the drug use is the thing that can mess somebody up more than any other. Yes, like you can overreach someone to the point of rhabdomyolysis and training. Yes, you can diet someone to the point of some kind of eating disorder. But there's at least a degree of recovery strategy for those. If you really mess your drug design up, your You may not see it now, but you're taking years off of somebody's life at the other end. Um, So you need to be able to practically understand the drugs that you're using and also to have a conversation with the client about risk to reward. So something that I will have done with both of you. Okay, here's the kind of things that we can do. Here's the goals. Here's the way that you can get there. Here's some kind of titration method. Here's all the risks, but understand that I'm asking you if you want to do this, and then we'll frame it in that. Because many times I've had a client go, you know what, I don't think the bodybuilding thing's really for me, Where, but I, I want to kind of improve my physique over the long term, maintain a good look, so um, where should I be? And it'll be far lower than, okay, well, I want to be a professional bodybuilder. You know, see, it's not just, here's your drug plan. 
It should never work with that. It's like, right, what are we working with with the goals? What's the time frame? And what risk are you willing to take? I found like putting like a numerical value to it, like you did with the milligram per kilogram method. Mm. I found that quite useful of kind of putting it onto perspective for them saying, right, well, this is what the, not all of them, but some of the top pros and like Olympians would be using in and around that range of what, between 20 to like some of them, even 30 milligrams per kilogram at the, the stupid end of the scale. This is where we would start you at five to six milligrams per kilogram. And that's still far out of super, you know, sorry, out of natural range. You're in that super physical, super physiological realm. That's the distance between safe or low risk, low reward, sorry, and extremely high risk, high reward. Mm. Yeah, the, the milligram per kilogram marker has come under um, criticism which I understand because I don't think it's reflective of a compound's efficacy or potential anabolism or something like this. That's really not the reason I would use it. I use it as a benchmark for constructing starting points and accumulation points, end points, peak loads, and as a reference, like you said, to what other people are doing. Um, another problem with, I think, many coaches is they won't actually work with or know anyone that is, as you said, Olympian level, many IFBB pros, you know, so they don't have a reference point. They might just read something on a forum and be like, right, this is what they're doing. When, I mean, uh, it's sad to say, and people can believe this or not, I consult with people that write things online that I know they're not doing um, because I <laughs> do their drug stacks. Um, and they'll very, more often than not, it's like, leaning towards the truth but it's not the truth you know it's like for example if a very common one is cruising and i'll see a client right like yeah i'm just on trt and they're not on trt they're on like 300 milligrams of test with 200 milligrams of primo or something and understand that that's a million miles away from trt you know for a lot of people that's like five times the androgen load of trt and growth hormone and lantus and nova rapid and injectable L-carnitine, and telmasatan, and metformin. It's like, yeah, you're not just on TRT. So, you know, it, you need to have a, have a practical understanding of what those people are doing there. But then you see it on the other side as well, you know, all the pros are using like five grams or something. Well, most of the time they're pros because they have these incredible responses. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of a single pro that I work with that accumulates more than like two and a half gram at the end, which is still a lot of drugs, you know? I'm not here to tell anybody that you should only use like 500 milligrams either for like two years and think that it's gonna get you somewhere. Um, but anyway, yeah, we got well sidetracked there. Another um, thing on safe use, I'd say when it comes to compound selection and a, a general misunderstanding, especially when it comes to anabolic steroids of how they work again. So the education thing is important. Um, let me give you an example. So there's something called the Hirschberger assay. Have you boys heard of this? You've mentioned it to work to me before. So this is where the first anabolic androgenic ratios came from. Um, and this is a rat study. So firstly, anyone that's familiar with science, we see surrogate models like rats, pigs, sheep, very common. You got to go, hmm, interesting, but may not or probably not, translate to humans, I think um, but interesting cool. nonetheless. So what these researchers did was take the seminal vesicle of, of a rat, which is meant to like represent the human prostate as a marker of androgenicity, but seminal vesicle is not a prostate, and a rat seminal vesicle is not a human prostate. Um, and the levator arni of a rat, which is like the rat's anus muscle, like a rat's arsehole, basically. Um, Couple of problems. One, like I'm not interested in asshole growth for the most part. Um, it's a smooth muscle. It's not a skeletal muscle. We're interested in skeletal muscle growth. And also I'm not trying to get hench rats. I have human clients for the most part, again, um, that need to grow. So, so you know, the, the efficacy of these don't, you know, rat models, anyone that's followed drug therapy studies and, and, and read the rat models and then watched it um, transpire into human data, 
I, I can't even give you one example of when it's been like, oh, that did the exact same thing as it did in the rat, you know. Uh, and th this rings true for anabolics. But anyway, the Hirschberger assay would, would apply the drug to the seminal vesicle and the levator arnie of the rat. And the more the levator arnie grew, or gained weight, I should say, because it's done by weight, they measure that as animalism, a net amount of animalism. And the more the seminal vesicle grows, the more androgenicity they note there um, in changing weight. And then they use testosterone as a benchmark. And they said, right, it's going to be one androgenicity and one animalism. That doesn't mean, firstly, that testosterone is as anabolic as it is androgenic. That's not what one-to-one -one means. That's another um, misnomer. They just use that as a benchmark to track the other compounds from. Um, and basically, they would use that like, okay, two would mean it's twice as androgenic, and five would mean it's five times more anabolic than testosterone in this, in this rat. So you look at something like Trembolone that came out as... Five times. Five times. Yeah. Like just yeah. just think about it, right? Have you ever seen someone take trend and gain five times as much muscle as testosterone? You know, come on. Like, when has that ever happened? Someone listening to this going, that was to me. Um, lucky you. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a great example because when Trembolone was in human use, and yes, anybody listening, trend was deployed in humans, in fact, for the androgen sensitive, which is women, elderly people. Children, I don't think it was used in children. I'm pretty sure it was just like there was a the branded one for postmenopausal women. I can't remember what the brand. Yeah, Parabolan. This was Trend Hex, which was a 75 milligram depot that, when cleaved, ended up as 50 milligrams every 10 days. The reason for this is because Trembolone is a steroidal SARM, um, which basically means it has a tissue selective nature and it is divorced from androgenicity. Um, other examples of steroidal styles being Anabar, Primabolum, Masteron, um, the good stuff, basically. Um, so there's an example of that. It wasn't five times more androgenic. In fact, it was far less androgenic than testosterone and about just as anabolic. So that model is like, okay, now I understand that that's nonsense. Let me get back to compound selection because what people do is they say, oh, have you heard of this um, DHB? It's dihydroboldenone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone told me this is super primo because it's got an anabolic androgenic ratio of like a million to one or something like it's gonna, I'm going to gain so much more muscle. Um, says who? Says the rat, you know, and then you look, go on PubMed humans, dihydroboldenone, how many studies? None. This concerns me. Um, so firstly, you don't know what it, so there's no predictable outcomes i'm going to assume that it's probably just as anabolic as everything else because you find in human studies that everything at the androgen receptor does about the same thing um and that's not to say that all steroids have muscle at the same rate because there's lots of other stuff that they do but let's just talk about anabolism um they do about the same thing um but then how androgenic is it i don't know no one actually knows um what negative consequences can we expect from escalating dose no one knows where's the therapeutic dose don't know so where are you going to dose it i mean someone on facebook group said like 50 milligram a week who's he mm. what's he based on because there's no research for example and i always give this example so excuse me if this is exhaustive um covid vaccine um they roll it out and they say listen this has never been tested on humans. So we don't really know the dose that you require for effect. Um, however, um, you should take it because someone on a Facebook group said that it works really well or someone else used it and they said it was really good. Who's going to take it? But there's people that won't take it now and it's gone through pretty heavy clinical data testing. You know, who's going to take that? No one in their right mind, but bodybuilders have this delusion when it comes to gaining muscle where they can convince themselves that just about anything is a good idea um however they'll retire from bodybuilding and go what why did i do that you know so compound selection within a safer use model i would highly recommend that we only use 
molecules that have been tested and approved for clinical use in humans, not failed, not abandoned, not never tested. There's a reason why things fail and are abandoned. Um, so, and before someone says trenbolone isn't in human clinical data anymore, it was voluntarily removed. It didn't fail and it wasn't abandoned and it could be used in human data just fine. The manufacturer abandoned it. Um, sorry, um, voluntarily removed it. So drugs that were approved for human clinical use would fall into my recommendations here. Um, and there's really nothing that would urge me to not do so. I don't see a requirement elsewhere. Um, you know, everything that we have access to that has been approved for human clinical use, like it, it is enough. It really is enough. Believe me, like it's extremely potent when you put all of these compounds together, which brings me sort of onto dosing. Um, this is where your risk factor comes in, really. So all of these things, if they're approved for, if they're approved for human clinical use, you can get on PubMed and you can find what dosing they've been used clinically for what durations and then create a pretty um, accurate assessment of how safe something will be. Like for example, all of this person used TRT for 80 years. Uh, these people, you know, this systematic review on TRT shows that testosterone replacement therapy is, you know, equivocably over the board, perfect. Okay, cool. There's no health issue with that. Um, but then maybe you might look at some muscle wasting disease studies on anadrol or something. Like, okay, well, these individuals using like, two to three milligram per kilogram per day of anadrol, that's like 300 milligram of anadrol a day or something. Yeah, they, they saw some like hepatic, yeah, that's a real clinical dosing. They saw some hepatic um, inflammation or something. You can get a pretty good idea. Um, and then you're gonna have to make the choice how far above those predictable outcomes you can go. So like we said, like the, the, the like escalation of dosing exponentially increases the risk. I think once you're above about 50% of the deployed dose, I'm going to say, because you have different doses, right? You have the clinically sort of deployed dose, the dose that's in clinical practice. Then you have trial dosings, so doses that have been used in clinical trials. Like, for example, Prima Bolum was used at 1,200 milligrams in women in one study, which is a lot. Now... This was used, I think it was 12 weeks. And actually, most women tolerated it quite well. But understand that if you use that as a woman for any extended duration, especially over and over again, you're going to have pretty significant virilization. Now, if you know, like, the effective dose could be like 0.5 milligram per kilogram for four to six weeks for what you're looking for, the further above and beyond you escalate that, the more exponential issues you're going to have. So, like, for example, TRT, if we said it's like two milligram per kilogram, if you went to 3.5, yeah, you're probably going to be okay if you're handling everything else in your life well. Now, if you get to six, seven, eight, you're making a choice to like exponentially increase the risk. So that's always down to the individual, you know. Um, but at least you know. The benefit is at least you know what you're dealing with. Better the devil you know. Mm -hmm. so, you know to kind of mitigate as much as possible of the negative health effects that can come over time with the use mm. of and metformin, bring down angiotensin 2, bring down oxidative stress. So there, there is ways to kind of not, you can't always prevent it because there's obviously genetic outliers. There's a lot of people that are going to exhibit certain expressions that are just, they're just going to happen, but you can try and control it as best as possible and better your chances. Yeah, so that's a great point, you know, within a, safer use model there's a couple of things ancillary drug wise that you'd want to be aware of so i mean i'm going to say something and then i'm going to completely go against my own rule so you, firstly you would avoid the use of ancillary drugs um that bring about additional stress for no clear benefit um for example let's say we have 750 milligrams of net androgen load that we require to grow um, or to require to get to our goal at whatever amount of time. So we choose to use 750 milligrams of testosterone. Okay. And then we require a milligram or half a milligram of arimidex every day to control the estrogenic side effects of this, right? Okay. So you've still got that 750 milligrams of testosterone at the 
androgen receptor doing what it needs to do. So our muscle gain and goal is cool. And uh, now you've reduced your estrogen. Um, this can get a little bit technical, but let's keep it basic right now. Estrogen is extremely anabolic, but you know that androgen estrogen ratio was not suitable for us. We're having estrogenic side effects, so we had to pull that down. So let's just say, okay, now our estrogen is analogous to what we would have been producing at um, half of that, so like roughly three hundred and fifty milligrams of testosterone. Let's say, mm -hmm. um, so you've introduced a drug that is absolutely critically terrible for your health. Like aromatase no, inhibitors. Say again? Are you saying that this is now put in, this like Arimidex is now there for no reason? If you're using the 750 milligrams of testosterone, it's there for a reason because it's there to control the estrogenic side effects. However, if you've only got four, uh, 350 milligrams of testosterone worth interacting with the aromatase enzyme, here's a better idea. Let's just use 350 milligrams of testosterone. Okay, but we require 400 milligram more for anabolism. Okay, well, why don't you just take that 400 milligrams from a molecule that doesn't interact with the aromatase enzyme, like Primo or Masteron, and you will have, like we said earlier, about the same amount of anabolism, and again, the same amount of estrogen, but you haven't had to use the aromatase inhibitor that's absolutely shit for your health. Oh. Makes sense, right? So avoid the use of aromatase inhibitors. Selective estrogen receptor modulators, the same like tamoxifen. I would not recommend Clomid. I mean, a, a shitty example on my behalf, but I kind of I kind of look at what they can do to the body. I always had troubles with skin acne. Now, acne is really not important when you're looking at things you should be concerned with when using performance enhancing drugs. But when using, you know, in the past, I used to use uh, one, I think it was one tablet of Arimidex every day at one point. It even went to two a day to control my estrogen. My acne flared up so far beyond what had ever been in the past. Similarly, when I come off cycle, used a PCT protocol, tamoxifen, clomid and everything, it drove up oxidative stress through them, you know, beyond control, which made my acne even worse. So what's that doing? What is the oxidative stress and free radicals doing internally that I'm not seeing? Exactly. Yeah. Oxidative stress is like a primary concern of any PED user. Something that we drive up hard through everything that we do. So having a, a pretty comprehensive range of antioxidants on hand is, is important, not only over the counter, but also, which brings me to breaking my rule of ancillary drug use. Using an ancillary drug like metformin is a good idea if you're a bodybuilder. This is a drug that I would call like a multi-pronged drug, as in it does lots of stuff, all of it very cool. So one of, it, one of its actions being very potent antioxidant properties, which is why as you said, George, is used in metformin, uh, used in acne um, literature, clinical practice and whatnot. It helps, it's helped me as well. I truly believe when I started to use metformin, I was typical with, you know, small acne outbreaks. And mm. once, because I was lazy with things like metformin and things like that, and I'd like forget, and I'd be like, ah, oh, it'd be all right. Cause I wasn't thinking too much on it. Then, you know, little things, obviously, as steroid users, you may find your skin gets a bit oily every now and then. And you're thinking, mm. what's going on there, obviously? And... Then I have like a breakout and I'm unsure why. And then I'm more consistent with taking things like metformin and then all of a sudden it will go away. I can't explain necessarily why that's happening, but all I know is when I make a more conscious effort, the negative effects seem to dissipate. You know, they seem to like wear off a little bit. And it's, it was just, you know, I've kind of got a little bit lost there, but you're going to have to jump in. <laughs> well, um, yeah, metformin use is... I would say a baseline requirement for PED users. It's like a no brainer. I've got a pretty long lecture on physique collective on metformin where I go through like every bit of data that I can find on it. It's a pretty long one, but if anyone's interested, it's worth watching. We go through the insulin sensitivity effects, the gut microbiome effects, which is very interesting when it comes to an anti-aging standpoint, the oxidative stress, blah, 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 appetite control. It's a pretty incredible drug, which brings me on to another incredible drug. Um, an angiotensin receptor blocker is the category, and all of them will contribute towards somewhat turning down the negative cardiovascular effects of androgen use. 
So specifically, we're talking about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And through interactions or activation of this system, androgens cause ventricular wall hypertrophy. We want to inhibit that to the maximum degree. So we would use an angiotensin receptor blocker. Now, my recommendation would be telmosartan, but there's others like candesartan and losartan. I like telmosartan because there's other stuff that it does. It's got some research on myostatin inhibition and PPAR modulation. Like if anybody's familiar with the PPAR pathway, we're talking about um, like cardarine, for example, is a, is a PPAR modulator. So increasing fat oxidation, glucose disposal into the muscle cell, increased aerobic capacity and all that good stuff. And also attenuating aldosterone is always good visually. You know, pulling off fluid retention, which is an issue for a lot of big bodybuilders, um, is pretty cool. Like th this is the mechanism by which estrogen increases fluid it's like estrogen doesn't increase fluid but estrogen increases aldosterone which increases fluid retention so pulling down aldosterone is going to help with that to tell us how to know metformin are two drugs that i think should be in every bodybuilder's arsenal if they're going to use them safer 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 um metformin of 500 milligram a day i think is fine and tell us how to know 40 milligrams per day i think is fine but you can titrate or reduce for effect basically um george you you mentioned like things like a hierarchy of things you should be interested in there in terms of like negative consequences of drug use yeah i think my greatest fear is neurotoxicity um we're learning more about this as the research develops and it doesn't look good really in fact it looks terrible so what we currently know, or rather, I won't belabor anymore with a ramble on this. Let me give you some practical recommendations. So estrogen is neuroprotective. So we wouldn't want to turn down estrogen at all. Again, another reason not to use an AI. Um, there are issues with anabolic steroids that are synthetic progestins. Um, the most common used in our cohort being nandrolone or trembolone. Um, Trembolone is really effective at glucocorticoid receptor inhibition. So it does what it does in terms of protecting muscle tissue when dieting down better than like anything. There's a use for it, but understand that the risk is that you will be exposing yourself to a synthetic progestin that is neurotoxic and more neurotoxic than other anabolics. Um, so either don't use it or use it minimally as infrequently as possible at the lowest dose possible you know so well, most I mean, of my guys will use between 50 and 100 milligrams a week when they're dieting which is not really that often you know can um, i jump in there with things like using things like tremblo which i started to steer away from would be negative sides on tremblo mainly mentally which i experienced and you know this isn't uncommon to bring on things like anxiety and it's so hard to pinpoint why was I feeling, say, anxious at that point? Is it the drugs I'm using or is it other things going on? You know, like George, with things we had going on months ago, was it things you've got going on or was it alongside using drug use? So can you go into why there may be some mental side effects to using certain drugs such as Tremblone? Yeah, I think, like, it, as you said, it's hard to create, like, an accurate assessment because, like, right, I'm on prep. I'm really lean. I'm starving, my sleep shit, and I get angry at something. It's like, it's got to be that trend. Uh, it could be like, That's this one guy. of all of those things. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Yeah, it could be one of many things. But I've also heard a lot of things from like people I've consulted with or clients that I think is like um, a cognitive bias. I remember one ages ago where a guy had said that he dropped his keys and he ended up like caving the side of his car in with his foot. He was so angry. Like kicking the side of his own car. I said, yeah, and I mean, <laughs> trembling use may bias like more neural impact, like neural drive um, through its action as a progestin, but it's not going to make you cave the side of your car. Like, like a lot of times people are looking for, that was the trend, an excuse. Not the fact that you're an arsehole. Yeah. Like yeah. really a lot of people are just dickheads like that get angry at stuff, especially when they're dieting. But no, you're right. I'm not going to excuse it at all. Like synthetic progestins do 
carry those kind of issues. If you look at, for example, I did a, this is completely separate, but I did a birth control podcast about progesterone and synthetic progestins. Um, and you look at the role of progesterone and what activating the progesterone receptor does, and you'll see um, some stuff, you know, when neurologically things can happen, which is what we see. And, and it's likely, uh, although the research isn't really there, indicative of its neurotoxic effects, because it really does. And the same thing with nandrolone. How many times have you seen the anecdotes like nandrolone made people lazy or depressed and things like this? So, yeah, I think when it comes to things like nandrolone as well, it's like usually used as a growth promoter. For me, it's like, I just don't see the reason to use it. There's so many other compounds that drive protein accretion like we said to just fine without that neural impact i don't see any reason why you would use it so so what could we do to, to well try and protect our, our brain health in the long term and try to avoid these neurotoxic effects first thing is don't expose yourself to the compound I tell um, you. <laughs> if you can do that if that's in your risk to reward Okay, if you want maximum bodybuilding outcomes, you know. Am I, am I negatively affecting my bodybuilding outcome by say not wanting to use a particular drug? Would you say? Um, let's use the example of Tremblo. It's yeah. hard to say um, because let's say you choose not to use Tremblo, so you don't get the benefit of turning down muscle protein breakdown. That may mean that you need to expose yourself to in general more androgens to maintain your muscle on the way down. Like the, yeah, so then yeah. you're just pulling one health cost for another. Um, so it's going to depend on you. If you're extremely musculature, right? If you're extremely muscular, sorry. If you're a big person, then your androgen load requirements to get peeled out of your brain are probably pretty high. I would confidently say in those scenarios, if you don't use Trembolone in modest dosages then yeah it's probably to a health detriment because of what else you choose them to do if you say no i i accept the muscle loss then cool but yeah you will cost your bodybuilding outcomes say um for example with my use i was using 100 milligram and then soon after there was things going on and you know i was saying about anxiety and things like that would there be a possibility of the next time we're thinking of introducing something like this, that we are thinking, right, there's a bit of a risk there, but we're willing to chance things. Would we say half the dose should I go to 50 milligram and then kind of just almost, not like, um, is it trial by error or trial it to see yeah. how, how that goes? Yeah. I mean, all of my models involve titration. I'm Which not is, a fan. That's a big so word. this is an example for, for anybody using anabolics is like, I don't like the on off kind of thing like right we're going to run a gram and then we're going to be at trt i don't like this model i think androgen load exposure just ends up higher over the lifetime and it's unnecessary you know we know how adaptations work and we know how fatigue accumulation works so we never go it's analogous to me saying right for week one of my next trainer block i'm going to train with every single amount of sets i can do and functionally overreach by the end of week one where have you actually got you know so i follow these titration models maybe we'll start at 300 milligram and then it might go 350 well I, i've i've been cruising for a while and i just wrote my own drug block for the next periodization and i basically start at 400 milligram and i add 50 milligram per week until the end of the block which is fairly low risk because i'm not trying to be a good competitor here i'm just trying to make pretty good outcomes you know yeah. um whereas for many clients it might be 100 milligram a week for this amount of time or it might be 50 milligram a week for a much longer period of time the androgen load is important depends on the periodization so yeah man like most people i'll start at 50 milligram a week i say in a prep and we'll run that for whatever amount of weeks then we could titrate to 100 or 75 or something like mm -hmm. that but I, I rarely breach 100 one thing I'd like to go into as well. I know we're getting a little bit short on time, but coming off, because I've just finished my 12-week cycle, I've had 12 mm. weeks. That's all I can stay on for. Do you mind debunking that a bit and going into your views on 
coming off on risk, hammering hormones, levering them off, fucking your hormones, and just elaborate for us. Turning off and on of that. Say so again. Constant turning off and on of the HBTA or attempting to. Yeah, yeah, that's that's you. So there's a bit to unpack there. Like, let's assume this is in a bodybuilder because I think that's the cohort that are probably listening to this. So these people are not only using steroids once. So in this scenario, individual is using anabolics for 12 weeks and then they decide to come off. Um, two options for there. Reason, to eat. For what reason would this indivi- individual be thinking, I've got to come off because I can't stay on for longer than 12 weeks. I have to come off, you know? That's a typical so they, they might be thinking that there's some down regulation at the aromatase, uh, at the androgen receptor, which there isn't. Like it's pretty well clinically defined that androgen receptors upregulate in the presence of androgens. Um, My so girlfriend's not... crawling across the floor, so she's not on camera. <laughs> I like the dedication, mate. Jazz would just walk in. <laughs> she's escaped. <laughs> <laughs> escaped. It's like fucking Squid Games over at Alex's house. Um, right. So they they would they maybe think that there's some down regulation at the androgen receptor now down regulation and desensitization are different things and um it's not really clinically defined if like the protein accretion driven by androgens does desensitize with repeat exposure i've got my like hypotheses and theories that involve things that happen post binding at the androgen receptor potentially talking about myostatin and things which is another reason why i think that accumulation models make more sense but anyway you, you can absolutely stay on longer than like 12 weeks, like nothing stops happening at the androgen receptor, but there's some hypotheses to be made that things may begin to slow down, either in terms of a degree of desensitization, if that exists, or this individual just requires more now because they are X amount of size that their amount of anabolism needs more, which is a real thing as well. Um, so maybe they decide, decide to come off for whatever reason. Um, their options are to either pct or to not and like surely the obvious one is right i need to pct but is it so there's a study called the dutch study i think it's spelled d no i'm thinking of a different paper the harlem study h-a-a-r-l-e-m my friend peter bond was a contributor to this um this is like a study from the netherlands i think um of bodybuilders that use anabolic steroids and come off. Some of them came off without PCT and some of them came off with PCT and they correlate the results of return to endogenous testosterone function and blah, 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 to see which one's most efficacious. And across the board, the individuals that use the PCT protocols see a longer duration of time to restoration of natural testosterone, um, which I think is obvious to anybody that knows how these drugs work. There's always a degree of negative feedback inhibition with drugs like HCG, for example, that drive up intratesticular testosterone. If you're like synthetically driving up luteinizing hormone, how do you expect your own luteinizing hormone to like be doing anything? You know. Um, so if you're going to do that, your best option is to not take PCT. And there's some very nasty effects of PCT drugs. You know, you're basically taking like female breast cancer and fertility drugs to try to restore your own HPG axes, which is no. like. You don't want to be doing that. Um, so let's say this individual comes off and like PCTs, which is the normal thing. And like, now you've got all that nasty uh, health effects that come with the PCT drugs, but the individual is also now hypogonadal, which means clinically low testosterone, which is associated with increases in multiple disease risks, not to mention quality of life is rubbish. You're losing muscle. You can't bang your missus. You know, it's all a bit of a, a sad cloud hanging over you all day. Um, and you trudge through this for, let's say, 12 weeks. Maybe you've got some natural testosterone back by then. Maybe not. It varies. Maybe it's all back. Cool. And then you go back on gear and the whole thing was a waste of time because now you've shut down your HPG axes again. So what did the natural test do? Health. Other than it. Well, you know, let's talk about health. A good period of that time would have been spent being exposed to PCT drugs and living with clinically low testosterone, which is terrible for your health. Maybe the last few weeks was, uh, you know, okay for your health. Um, the alternative would be to just use testosterone replacement therapy between your your drug, uh, your higher drug use. That would be the healthiest approach. 
how was that calculated? Sorry, how was that calculated per individual? Because surely there was not just one TRT dose for everyone. Um, yeah. What was your calculation for per individual for a safe testosterone replacement therapy? You'd have to work through blood work because there's quite a high degree of biological interindividuality. Saying it's somewhere between one to two milligram per kilogram per week is going to have the majority of people set good, but there are outliers. Like I'll use myself as an example. I got my blood work done. Um, when was it? It was when it was when we were at the Battle of Bedford, and I am between cycles at the minute. And I'm using 250 milligrams of testosterone. A lot of people go, "That's a cycle. That's not a cruise." Well. I, I got my blood work done and I microdose every single day. So there's a stable flat line and it was 28 N mole. So normal you know, range. That's pretty, yeah, it's normal range. And it's like, okay ish. It's not like high, high. It's like near the top. It's at, of the the, range. It's at obviously the top end, but yeah, the range is fine. So where, right. how, how could someone argue that, that that's a cycle? Uh, you can't. People that don't understand the drugs could. Um, so th there's a degree of biological into individuality, but I've had my blood work done on that dose many times, and that's all, it's always around that 25, 25 to 30. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I just thought it was interesting to put that in there. So that could be where I would cruise at if I want maximum health outcomes. But hey, if I'm a professional bodybuilder pushing a pro card, maybe I don't want to go that low. That's your risk to reward again. You know, maybe you want to stay at 300, 400, 500, whatever, just leave space to accumulate but understand greater exposure to androgens drive the negative health consequence, you know? Um, so yeah, my recommendation would be not, not to come off. If you decide to use anabolics, it's a lifelong decision and you'll have to live with it. It's not a bit of fun for six months or something. You know, you, these drugs were really designed for lifelong deployment. So that's the way to go. Mm. sounds like on this podcast i've just said use lots of different drugs and stay on all the time <laughs> it's, it's, it's the healthier way yeah 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 in and, the way that we right. as obviously we're like wrapping it up a little bit here as you know we're not too short on time um i know a lot of this to anyone listening can go over your heads it goes over mine a lot of the time you know it's not it's not nothing wrong to admit that and just trying to take away something more positive about try not to listen to your average gym bro in the gym saying my met says, says take 600 milligrams of testosterone. Take, no, no, no. You want to take test 400. That's what you want to take. No, no, no. You want to take um, arimidex and tamoxifen if you're on cycle, you know, stay away from those sort of common yeah, sayings. And sorry. yeah, of course. Yeah, of, like we all, we all learn, you know, from the bottom, I did TTM for my first cycle ever, you know, Go, going to Ibiza thinking it was the right thing to do, you know, and yeah. you're just a, a, a dumb 18 year old. And I admit that that was me. And I'm not trying to say I'm all high and mighty because I'm invested in knowledge elsewhere. It's trying to learn, trying to pass it on the best way because there is negatives here and on a journey to learning that. I'll give you an example as well. So Leon, when he did his first ever consultation with me, he was like, yeah, I'm using like 500 milligram of tests with, um, what was it? Fucking some kind of slam and like D-ball or something. It was like horrific. Say again? MK677 is usually the common one, isn't it? The growth. Uh, yeah, I swear he was using that as well. And I was like, what the fuck? And now he weighs like 75 pounds more than that on, I mean, <laughs> far less than that. <laughs> Yeah, so it's not always about just titrating your dosages up all the time. It's about using the amount that reflects the outcome that you desire. Yeah, completely. Uh, another thing just to add, leading on from what Al said, even like listening to individuals like Joe, people that respectively have, you know, have proven time and time again that they know what they're talking about, even then, don't take everything as gospel. Have some, you know, some, some of your own intuition to go away and go, right, They've said this. I'm going to go and see if what they're saying matches to research papers. I'm going to take it on my own back just to clarify. It'll help you with your own knowledge. It'll help you reinforce keeping that you know knowledge for a long term rather than just someone saying it, you doing it and forgetting that the why behind it. Always take some intuition off your own back to go and not double check, but just show some some willingness to actually learn. Yeah. So anybody listening that's interested in learning some more 
I'd recommend that you sign up to Physique Collective. The motto there, the mantra is physique development made simple. So a lot of what I've said on this podcast may sound a bit jargony. I apologize for that. They get on me about that at Physique Collective and we do these very short videos. Like the longest video that I've got on there is 10 minutes. So I always keep it under 10 minutes on one topic about pharmacology. Um, and it's very simple. It's edited to break down everything that I'm saying, etc. So I highly recommend you guys go and check that out. We've got content on training, supplementation, drug use, lifestyle, business. Mention the forum as well. Obviously, everyone log in. What's going on? Yeah, the forum is a good idea for people to check out as well because it gives you a, a reflection of what people are actually doing. Um, IFBB pros there, high-level competitors, and then just your normal kind of gym rat people um, and they write up their drug use and ask for critical feedback or just as a notation of what they're doing and post their physique shots up. And you can look at that and go, ah, okay, well, th this person doing this, but then this person suggested this. And you can learn through association of what people are actually doing rather than what a YouTube channel says that they're probably doing, you know? I cannot stress this enough as well. This is six ninety nine. Right, you probably spend more than that in Starbucks when you go get your large triple XL venti mochaccino shit thing. But that's yeah. a month to have readily, easily accessible, correct information around your health and <laughs> pet enhancements. It's a it's a win. Yeah. yeah, man. I think that's like what people miss. That it's six ninety nine. Like, trust me, I don't make any money off this thing, man. <laughs> like, I could just do some more consoles and make more money. But Physique Collective was a passion project for me. Um to be able to like support everyone involved in there and support everyone that's signing up. Like we had the app built, like apps are ridiculously expensive for anybody that doesn't know. <laughs> hey, look, I clearly didn't make any money off the company. Like it, it's just trying to create a community that's supportive. I think, I think that's what we needed more than anything, like a friendly place that you can come and ask questions and see what other people are doing and stuff. So it really is just like reinvesting into the improvement. Yeah. I mean, there's other forums obviously out there and apps you can join and things like that. But I think the communication between, you know, individuals on there, it's, it is, it is friendly, you know, and it's real. It's not hidden behind. Like I went on another forum and I asked questions and the answers are very, I don't want to say bro, you know, I have to use that, but I don't know. It's just so much easier to talk to individuals that will keep it real and don't hide behind. Oh yeah. I'm actually doing, three times the amount that I'm saying, but I'm recommending you to take three times less because that's considered safe by everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Right, lads? Oh, anyone that wants to find me, Instagram, Joe underscore Physique Collective. If you want to listen to my podcast, Optimal Physique Development, that's on joejeffreycoaching.com. And for Physique Collective, either just physiquecollective.com or Physique Collective in App Store or Play Store. And that's that. Thanks for having me, guys. There is, no, thank you for coming. There is anyone that would rather go a little bit further and, and may, may have a bit more knowledge behind certain subjects. Uh, where I started was Joe Jeffrey. Was it joejeffreycoaching.com? Yeah. You've got, your yeah. Articles, you've got your articles and papers that you wrote. They're, very, they're, they're a lot more simplified than what you'll find on PubMed, but still a little bit more advanced than the Physique Collective Broken Down videos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, guys, thank you again for listening. A uh, big thank you, Joe, for coming on. I'm sure it won't be his, his only appearance. <laughs> the world of anabolics, you could talk for hours and days upon end. Uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. We're back to the usual shit talk. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, peace out, guys. See ya. Peace.